today, what, what you're all here for, which I'm sure you're probably aware, is, uh, is to celebrate uh, the launch of the, the great publication, which is Confessions of a Recovering Data Collector, um, which is the first book to be published about uh, the notorious data collecting practice of uh, Ellie Harrison. Um, it's published by Plymouth College of Arts, and together with the space tonight, we're supporting the launch, and uh, also we're going to have a great uh, session in a second. Uh, the, the publications are on sale over there. Uh, there's two publications. You can buy this publication for five pounds, and you, if you want to buy the other one, is that correct? You can get two publications for ten pounds, which is uh, very good. And I'll remind you about that at the end. Um, First of all, um, I just want to, to welcome Ellie Bellinghausen and Sonny O'Reilly, who are here today to give us a brief, uh, give an introduction to the infliction known as data collection, uh, from which Ellie has suffered for so many years, <laughs> and to the outlay of the groundbreaking new therapy, uh, which, which to help Ellie to overcome her obsessive habits and become a better artist. So uh, I'd like to just welcome uh, Ellie Harrison and Sally O'Brien. Uh, welcome to this evening's session. We are. It, this is a sort of open therapy session. We will be going over some of the processes that Ellie and I went through together uh, when she was undergoing treatment uh, with this. This therapy that I've devised from years of teaching and talking to and writing about artists and their work. And uh, I think we, we can all agree that we're here because we think art is a good thing, art is a very productive uh, state to be in, if you like. You know, I think of art as a state rather than a, sort of an object over there. But it's not without its problems, and so that's why I've developed this, this um, hysterical historical practice therapy to try and realign some of the more kind of calcified joints, if you like, of, of art and art practitioners. So it's called a hysterical historical practice therapy, which gives you a clue to how it works. And we have his, the hysterical aspect, uh, which, which alludes to the immediate, visceral, emotive ways in which we think about art, both as observers, as viewers, and as practitioners and commentators. And then we have the historical aspect of it. So there's the immediate, the individual, and there is the, the broader overview. What does it mean to be an artist in the 21st century, after the 20th century? And we can look back further and further. We are, we are you know, as humans, as individuals, forever trying to place ourselves in our context. And we can bring that context in very close. We can talk about the art world, or we can talk about the universe. And hysterical historical practice therapy, it, it allows the artist to look beyond the immediate perimeter of their own practice, to break through certain boundaries that broaden their horizons and, and I think enriches their practice. Um, so just to quickly run over some of the possible problems that artists come to me about. There is, you see artists becoming entrenched, entrenched in signature uh, styles and, and methodologies. So, and this is due to pressures of the art market quite often, but often it's due to insecurity. So an artist will think, oh, that works, uh, and, and do it you know, endlessly, ceaselessly throughout their career, maybe sort of honing it, uh, um, maybe the odds sort of the side step, you know, by half an inch, uh, but, but it, it feels very hemmed in by its own self-consciousness. So th those sorts of entrenchment um, uh, uh, problems are, are what HHPT deals with, which is which is what Ellie uh, came to me with. Uh, she, she perceived this this binding force that was perhaps holding her back, and, and she wanted to break through this. And, and so we went through these five steps to reevaluate what she was doing along uh, many axes. Um, so you know the, the the individual in society, the self and others. The, the historical and the contemporaneous practice and theory, something we all struggle with, I think, you know, aligning those two things so that they're not permanently and um, forever sort of bumping into each other and compromising each other. Uh, and also 
think the instinctive and the intellectual approach to art making, and also looking at art being all white like that, but not quite sure why, uh, if you have to talk about it. You know, these disjunctures. And um, I think art and the world at large is, is, was the main point, was the, your main bone of contention. If I look at my notes here, um, I mean, your main problem was this data collecting, like shackle, it became. Uh, you started in 2000, it started in 2001, didn't it? Right, if I look right, right here, when you're, you're just finishing your degree at Nottingham, Trent University. And it seems only these first forays, but they were they were quite, they were full of jouissance, you know, like E22. Uh, can you tell me just briefly a little bit about E22 and, and how you remember feeling about that project when you embarked upon it? Um, well, I think probably the first thing I should say is that I never really set out to be a data collector. Um, it was one of those things that just kind of fell into. Really. Um, the first project or the first data collecting exercise that I ever took was E22. Um, and I was very young indeed at this point, and I didn't really, I wasn't that conscious of the kind of hole that I was beginning to dig for myself. So I very innocently set about attempting to take a photo of everything that I ate. Um, for the year following my 22nd birthday, and alongside the photographs, I began to collect information about the different foods different locations um, where the photos were taken and um, the dates and times, um, which I diligently recorded into a, a, an expanding spreadsheet. And so this, this, this did feel like a sort of rather jolly piece, didn't it? You know, it looks fantastic here on the, on the, on the projection. Um, you with the hairstyles, clothing, food, you know, it feels about, like it's about multiplicity. It feels about proliferation of possibilities these each represent, days in which you know, other stuff was happening around it. But I think it becomes more and more acute, doesn't it? That you, you have a sort of rundown here yeah. of, of, of various projects that become um, more and more intense. Yeah, I mean, I can give a sort of overview of how the data collecting got out of hand, if you like. So from, okay. from E22, as I said, this was 2001. Um, Years old, and I wasn't really aware what, what I was letting myself in for. I managed to do it, I managed to take a picture of everything that I did for a year. And then shortly after that, I launched into another year long project where it was almost as though I was trying to feed an urge in me to collect more information. So I started to record <coughs> the distance of all the journeys that I travelled on London Transport. And again, for a year, I began to add together these distances until, by the end of the year, I'd reached a massive 9,210 kilometres, which I calculated was as far as travelling from even Broadway to Shanghai in a straight line. Um, I made a series of posters that kind of documented this of distance. And it was then that I started really playing around with numbers and being very excited about data. So things started to get a little more serious when I began the daily quantification record project um, on the 1st of January 2003. And I thought it would be a good idea to fill out one of these small records each day for 2003. So I began um, collecting information about 16 different quantifiable aspects of my everyday life. Um, There's 365 of these. I'm not going to show them all today. Um, I had to look through them all. 